Um, my name's Kevin Anderson, and for some reason I've been asked to give a lecture here today, and I don't know the background to that at all. Um, but you all seem to be here, and you seem to have heard about it somehow, so you must know more about that than I do. Um, so I've been asked to talk for about 40 or 50 minutes, is that your understanding? A one hour slot on climate change? So if, if, it's, if you're not here for a climate change lecture, then you need to go somewhere else probably. So um, my name's Kevin Anderson, and I work on energy and climate change here at the University of Manchester. Um, and also in University of Uppsala in Sweden. And uh, I used, to, I should say, I used to be an engineer many years ago. I used to design and build offshore oil platforms in a previous life, um, quite a long time ago now. But for the last 20 or more years, I've been working particularly on climate change and in the Tyndall Centre for the last 20 years, which is a centre across different um, institutions in the UK. So today, um, I'm going to give a bit of a, a sort of whistle-stop tour through my take on climate change. And I called it here from delusion to action on climate change. And I've got a, an active Twitter account where I uh, post my thoughts and also links to things that I'm involved with or to other things that I think are worth reading. Um, uh, if as I'm speaking I go too fast, tell me to slow down. I have a really bad habit of going faster and faster, which when I lecture in Sweden is a problem. Um, and also if anything's not clear, just feel free to put your hand up and just, just ask. Because if you don't understand it, then it probably means that someone else won't as well. So just, just feel free to interrupt. Um, well, I'm going to start off with this statement uh, that was made in a paper that uh, myself and a colleague wrote quite a lot of years ago now. We were surprised it got through review. Uh, we thought it would be knocked out in the review process. It was an academic paper. It says, real hope, if it is to arise at all, will do so from a bare assessment of the scale of the challenge that we now face. So I think we have to be really clear about how, how difficult the situation is, is that we are in now. And that only once we do that can we start to think, well, what are the ways out of this dilemma, if there are ways out of it still? So I think it's important to bear that as a backdrop, and I'm going to just describe, as I go through my talk, that I think we have not been honest with ourselves um, or with the wider community. As academics, we've been, I think, um, abdicated our responsibility of being more honest and, and blunt about our conclusions. But I think, by and large, the NGO community has been like that, and even civil society. So across the board, we have almost like there's a, there's a process of, of self and collective delusion. I think that is changing, having said that. So I'm going to start off with uh, just the Paris Climate Change Agreement. Hopefully you all, if you've come today, you're all reasonably familiar with this, this agreement. And just, just outline the, the headline comments from that, or the, the, um, the take-home points, in my view, for the work that I'm doing anyway, is that we have promised in the Paris Agreement to take action to hold the increase in global average temperature to well below 2 degrees centigrade of warming compared to the pre-industrial periods, and ideally aim for 1.5. And the 1.5, which many of us were quite surprised when that emerged, that 1.5, came really from efforts of the poorer parts of the world saying, look, you know, 1.5 is still pretty disastrous for us. Two is, two is really devastating, so we should be aiming for something lower than two degrees. And just for on a cold day in Manchester, or a coolish day in Manchester anyway, two degrees is about six degrees in the poles. It's, it's a huge shift in the global climate system occurring within about 100 years. We've only seen about one degree of change over all, all the sort of 10,000 years of modern human time. And now we're talking about a rapid shift occurring almost overnight that ecosystems can't deal with, probably human systems can't deal with. So we're talking about rapid, very significant shifts, even at what look like quite low temperatures. We also have uh, agreed to undertake the changes in accordance with the best science and on the basis of equity. And let's again be quite clear that no one yet has taken equity seriously, either between countries, between the poor and the wealthy countries, or indeed within a wealthy country like the UK. We, we still pay just fairly lip service to the, concept, uh, to the concept of equity. So I'm going to touch on two points to start off with, on impacts, which is not my area of research, but I'm just going to raise a couple of points on that, and then focus mostly on mitigation, on reducing our emissions. So let's start off by, by, by acknowledging up front that the 1.5 to 2 degrees C challenge laid out in the Paris Agreement, or commitment rather than the challenge, um, is not just. It is unjust for many people in the world, and, many, and for future generations. So people today are suffering the consequences of climate change. You look at the, the way it exacerbated the, uh, the severity of the typhoon in, in Mozambique um, or Haiyan in the Philippines a few years ago, or indeed in Sandy. So climate change is already having major impacts, particularly on poorer communities elsewhere in the world. It's already having devastating impacts on a lot of ecosystems. We can see that already playing out, often as an exacerbating factor, along with lots of other things that we're doing that are ten putting tension upon the ecosystems. Um, it particularly affects women and children. The latest IPCC report points that out, and our own children will be suffering the consequences of climate change very soon, if they're not already in some parts of the world. 
So let's be clear that many people are already suffering, many are already dying, and many more will die as a consequence of holding temperatures to 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade. It is not a safe threshold. You know, it, it, this is a pretty devastating situation we're in. We've got ourselves to this position and we can't do anything better than this now. Um, I still think we'd probably be very lucky to hold to 2 degrees centigrade. So what we're doing, what we have been doing, is really destroying the prospects, or at least severely affecting the prospects for all species in the future. Not just us, but other species as well. So I now want to focus on, on the mitigation aspect. What we're going to do about this? What can we do about it? Um, and I think it's first important to bear in mind how badly we're failing on climate change. It's now 2019. The last year and a half have been a particularly exciting time from a climate point of view in that a lot more people have got engaged in these issues. What else has happened in the last year and a half? What have we been doing to really drive our emissions down and demonstrate our belief in this? Well, the UK is a is a, um, a sort of a self-avowed climate progressive uh, nation, and indeed so is Sweden where I work, and I often go to Norway and they're the same as well. They all claim to be doing a lot on climate change. Here's the Clare Ridge platform, phase two. First oil, November 2018. Planned operation, um, primarily by BP, um, with a number of other oil companies involved. Over the next 30 to 40 years, a quarter of a billion tonnes of carbon dioxide. That only went out in November 2018. Are we really serious about climate change? The Glengorm discovery in the North Sea. Wonderful announcements. Everyone's saying how marvellous will be for the industry, for tax revenue and everything else. Another 100 million tonnes of carbon dioxide. That's only this, this summer. Again, East, East Yorkshire this year. UK's biggest onshore gas field discovery near Hull. Planned emissions, 13 million tonnes of carbon dioxide. So this is one of the most, you know, this, this is a climate of our nation just building more fossil fuel de developments that are going to go on for the next two, three, four decades. Then we've got this, thankfully he's no longer in this position, um, we've got uh, this wonderful minister, and of course supported by most of the MPs in the House of Commons, all going for head for Heathrow expansion, knowing that that was completely incompatible with our Paris commitments. And indeed, if you look at the Committee on Climate Change's work, then um, it takes up about 40% their assumptions on aviation, 40% of the total carbon budget, and I'll come back to what that means later um, for the UK. So that single sector that is actually used primarily by a small group of people who, who are frequent flyers, that single sector is going to take up about 40% of the UK's fair Paris budget. <coughs> and yet despite all of this, we see pretty much silence, or we hear pretty much, or, or we don't hear, whichever you view this, silence or acquiescence from academia. Now, we should really be standing up and saying this is completely incompatible with our commitments on climate change. But then I suppose as a university that hasn't yet divested from fossil fuels, or at least openly announced that, like many universities haven't, then perhaps we think we shouldn't say anything. Or airport expansion, for us as academics like to be flying around the world, bestowing the pearls of wisdom on the little people beneath them. But we should, we should really have been doing something about this, but we haven't. All completely incompatible with Paris, and yet we just carry on. So is the UK showing any real leadership? Well, this is a committee, uh, some, hopefully some of you have come across this, a committee on climate change net zero report. Always watch out for the word net. It wasn't there three or four years ago. It's Latin, I pass the buck on to your children. <laughs> so net zero report. You'll see this everywhere now. Um, just, people just use the language without even thinking about it. In 2017, according to the, this report, the UK emissions were 42% below 1990, and 2018, for instance, going to be 44%. But take account of in, um, aviation and shipping, because that report doesn't include them, um, and imports and exports, and what you find out is we've had a 10% fall since 1990, not a 44% fall, and that's about a 0.4% reduction in emissions every single year. Sweden's the same as it was in 1990, Norway's up between 25 and 50%, Ireland's up, I think, 25%. Um, so you, you look across the board, most countries, even the wealthy countries, have done very little on climate change. So what does the IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it's the big UN body that collates the science every, every so often, what does that say about climate change? <laughs> I'm going to synthesise the science part of that in one line, which is a little bit disingenuous because there's a lot of, well not disingenuous, it's, it's, it's um, overly summarising all the wonderful work that is done by the IPCC, but from my point of view the important part is, is it's there's this line, it's carbon budgets that matter, not long-term targets. It's the carbon budgets, the total amount of carbon dioxide that we emit that links the temperature. So when you play that out, that has big repercussions for the policy realm. So no longer are we focusing, or should we focus on 2050, we should focus on, on today, tomorrow, the next day. So 
Stylistically, it's the area under the curve that matters. So there's emissions up here and years along the bottom. It's that total area that matters. And if in the short term we decide to build new offshore oil and gas platforms or exp expand Heathrow, then that means the emissions go up, and that means that our children will have to make the emissions come down more in the future. So we're passing the buck um, you know, across the generations again. <coughs> if we can do that, and I'm going to try to show, I don't think that is at all possible. Um, so if you pull together the, the latest report from the IPCC um, and play out this concept of carbon budgets, the headline comments are basically to stay within the sort of Paris compliant carbon budget range for 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade, so to keep emissions at that sort of level for the UK, uh, sorry, for the UK at the global level, then we can emit about 650 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide, which will mean nothing to most of you, I assume, unless you're a sort of climate change geek who works with these numbers every day. But the different, that might be a bit helpful though. We emitted that from energy about 37 billion tonnes in 2018, about 43 in total if you include deforestation. Um, but this is, this is from energy. Uh, so that gives us 18 years. At a global level, we've got about 18 years of current emissions before we blow the whole budget for the Paris Agreement. 18 years. Um, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So where do we go to from here? Well, I think it's important that we start off with a bit of sort of humility and recognise where we are. 1990, the first IPCC report. Now I'm looking around here, some of your parents hadn't met in 1990. Just think about that. Throughout all of your lives, your parents and your grandparents knew what it was we should do about climate change. And our parents have chosen it. Um, I'll be the age of your parents. Your parents, some of, some of you anyway, your, your parents have chosen to fail you, as I have as pretty much everyone in my generation. Collectively, we have chosen to fail the next generation. Um, we knew about this stuff in 1990. The emissions in 2018 were about 67% higher than 1990. So in 1990, and then in 1992 at the Big Earth Summit in Rio, um, we all got together and said, yes, we're going to do something on climate change and lots of other issues as well. And yet, emissions are 67% up. 2018, they went up again by about 1.6%, as did the year before. So we've known all of this throughout the lives of some of you here, and yet we've chosen to do nothing about it. 29 years, I should say, of complete failure on climate change at a collective level. Now, some of us have tried, but let's be blunt about it. We have to be saying we've tried and we have failed for lots of reasons that some are obvious and some are less obvious. For one thing, I think we've tried a whole series of what are called technocratic frauds. Um, partial accounting, let's conveniently ignore aviation and shipping. I mean, this is a ridiculous thing to do, but we have done that historically. And virtually all accounts still from nations don't include aviation and shipping emissions, not international ones. So if you flew from the UK to the US, those emissions would not be counted either US inventory or the UK's inventory of carbon emissions. They belong to God or someone else. So we've had partial accounting, which allows us to pretend we're doing something when we're really not. And it's quite a large part of emissions. It's 10% in the UK and about 15% in Sweden. Offsetting paying a poor person to diet for us. If you want to lose weight, you have to cut back on the chocolate yourself. You can't expect someone else to do it, and you'll lose the weight. And it's the same with offsetting. The idea that you can carry on emitting and pay a poor person elsewhere in the world to reduce their emissions is fraudulent on many levels. It doesn't work. I, my argument is it probably makes the situation worse. That's not to say we shouldn't help poor parts of the world financially make shifts to low-carbon futures, but we shouldn't use that as compensation for our emissions. The clean development mechanism. The real trick here is you take something that you know is fraudulent, and you give it a nice name. And as soon as you've done that, it sounds like it's formal, it's well thought through. People talk about gold standard offsetting. It's all a scam. So the clean development mechanism. It's a state-sanctioned offsetting. So governments can carry on doing things as they were before. Afforestation, the idea you plant a tree, you expand an airport. That argument is being made for Arlanda Airport in Stockholm. So the Stockholm, this is the Swedish government saying, well, we, we can compensate for expanding the airport by planting more trees in the north of Sweden. And when all of this fails, we're going to be relying on speculative, highly speculative, negative emission technologies. And I'll come back to these later. These are technologies that don't exist in reality. They're in the imagination of professors' minds, or probably postdocs' minds. Probably professors' minds aren't very imaginative when we get to my age. <laughs> postdocs' post minds, um, and a few very small pilot schemes. But we're relying on these in virtually all of the scenarios to reduce emissions in the future. Not we, sorry, our children have to do that. And when that fails, as most of us think it will do, even the people that put it in the models, many of them think that they will not work at that level. We're already thinking about geoengineering. You know, we, can't, you know, we, we can't even build a lecture room like this with windows. We still have to have gas-fired power to keep the lights on, but it's light outside. But we can geoengineer the planet, okay? <laughs> it's a 
this is a bit odd to me. So we're, going to, we're looking here at things like firing rockets into the stratosphere to spread out sulfate particles that reflect sunlight back out into space. Then those sulfate, sulfate particles migrate to the poles and you have to send up another rocket. So, you, so you're reflecting sunlight out into space and therefore you're changing the amount of heat arriving on the Earth. But then all of these things, we keep trying these sorts of things, but we haven't tried to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions. It just seems ridiculous that we've tried everything else but reduce our emissions, where we know that this is the one that matters. So what we've had is failure writ large at almost every single level. And so this is quite depressing, but I'm going to try and move this towards, there are plenty of things that we can start to do. Um, so it's not as if the whole message is doomsday. If it was, we might as well just go home and or go out and enjoy ourselves. There are things that we should be doing. And I'm going to base the rest of the presentation on some lyrics. Some, some of you will recognise these people. Others will think, who oh, is that old man? <laughs> um, Leonard Cohen. Um, I recommend his, his really good poet, and, and I like his singing as well. So ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. Um, this is from his uh, song, Anthem. So ring the bells that still can ring. We're not short of things today. We're not waiting for technologies. We're not waiting for some great idea. You know, we can, we can make sure that every house we build now is at zero carbon standard. We can retrofit existing houses. We can have a frequent flyer levy. We can make sure that every single new building has solar panels on it. Yet you know, we don't do that. You know, look at the new engineering building here. I mean, it was fit for purpose in the 1970s. It wasn't fit for purpose in 2019. And that's the, that's the same with virtually all the new buildings we see around us, that very few of them are fit for this century. They're fit for last century, yet we're still building them. So there are plenty of things that we can do, um, so we're not waiting for great ideas. Certainly, second though, is forget your perfect offering. So forget some of the, usually the top down by the great and good and high emitting types. Um, you know, the report from this report in 2006, a really influential report for anyone that can think back that far, the stern review about the economics of climate change, was you know, the maths in it were highly dubious. It was incredibly, well, not optimistic. It, it underplayed the actual empirical data about rising emissions at the time. But they give a, a view that you can maintain the current business as usual and green it. So that's what that report did back then. It's a challenge, but we can green the current business as usual. You've got the IPCC, which is split into different working groups. And working group one is the science, working group two is mostly on the impacts, and working group three is, well, what do we do about it? And that's highly political. So that's the bit on mitigation, and I think that has been part of the problem. It's always saying again, it's business as usual, just green business as usual. Rely on the future technologies. It's not about really, I think, addressing the, the fundamental challenge. I'm going to come back to that later. We've got the new climate. That's right, the, yeah, the new climate, new economy reports coming out. A whole group of people here, usually very high emission people, very well paid, producing these reports that, again, are business as usual. And then we've got the net zero report from the Committee on Climate Change in the UK, who I have a lot of time for, but I think they've been let down by their um, commissioners, the academic commissioners, but the actual secretariat, I think, are really excellent. Um, and, and indeed, so is the CEO. But nevertheless, this report is, is part of the, the 20th century, not part of the 21st century. All of these things smack of colonialism. And uh, I, I know that some of the people who I go on well with in the CCC don't like me saying this, but effectively what we're saying is we in the UK should have a much larger slice of the global carbon pie than we really deserve. So as I often say, we, you know, we, we took the slaves out of the continent of Africa, we then took their minerals, and now we want their carbon budget. So it's just carrying on with the same sort of approach, that we, you know, we're being a very wealthy country that's lived off the back of fossil fuels, is not even now prepared to say, well, we need to show some leadership. So it's colonialism, and I'll come back to that again later. But worse than that, it's buck passing. It's also saying, and we're going to ask the next generation to solve the problems that this generation cannot be bothered to solve. So it's passing the buck as well. And in the end, it allows us, like all of these reports, to basically greenwash business as usual. Okay, this one pushes a bit higher than these other ones here. But it's still, the system looks broadly the same, just different technologies. All of those will fail, are failing. And I'll try and show you why now. So how low, loud does the bell have to ring if we are to um, deliver on the Paris Agreement? So just going to put some, sort of, some graphs behind this. Uh, before Paris, this, this is emissions here and years out. This is at global level. Before Paris, we were heading up here. Heaven knows quite where, but something like four to six, six degrees of centigrade of warming across the century. Some people say we're actually heading back towards that now. Uh, certainly, the emissions are looking very high again at the moment. They're, they're not coming down. Um, at the Paris Agreement, prior to Paris Agreement, every country in the world, pretty much every country, uh, made its pledges to what it thought it could do. So what's your fair size of the slice, if you like? Every country submits that. 
and it comes out, if you add all the pledges together, three to four degrees centigrade of warming, which is still a different planet from the one on which we live. I mean, we wouldn't recognize that one if we were dropped into it. And yet what we've done in the Paris Agreement is promised to hold to um, uh, uh, 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade, and that comes out at about 650 billion tonnes, as I said before. So that looks something like this. So very different from what we were saying before. Zero carbon dioxide emissions by 2050, across the board, this is for energy, this is across the board at the global level, um, and that we have agreed to do this with equity as a key factor, and that's really important the Paris Agreement, despite the richer countries trying to water that down and weaken it every single year. But it's still there at the moment, which means that the wealthy countries have to show some leadership. So that may be the case sort of globally, but we'd have to be much earlier than that, and I'll come back to that again a little bit later. But what we saw at the Paris Agreement, and we still see, I think, a lot of this language now, um, in the body language or the actual words, sort of euphoria. You know, we've, we've, we can solve this problem with, without real major structural change to the world in which we live. And I think this is so different from the way I'm seeing the numbers. So why is it we can, we can have the numbers out of the IPCC, which is it's just the numbers I take, I just take the numbers from the main reports, and then just apply a bit of basic maths. And yet people are saying, look, this all looks quite doable. And I'm sort of saying, well, it doesn't really look like that. And the reason I think there's a difference between these two positions is because we have deluded ourselves for a long time that there are technologies out there that will solve the problem for us. And these technologies have been really important in these particular models and scenarios about the future from a group of modelers called the Integrated Assessment Modeling Groups. And there's only a handful of these around the world. They're always in wealthy parts of the world, huge models that you can't replicate, no one else can replicate because they're just so big. So you have to rely on the output of these models. And these models have much, much larger, or derive much larger, larger carbon budgets. So whilst this comes out of working group one of the IPCC, if you like, just the plain science, what you get with the other ones are much bigger uh, budgets, something like that. So this is the budgets that come out of these other models. And these models are not science models, they're models that are dominated by economics, with some sort of basic science in there and some engineering, some what called transitions theory and other things like that, say, well, what could we do about this? So, so if you, imagine you're a policymaker, or imagine you're the head of a department in a university who likes doing their field work. Which would you prefer, the blue line or the red one? You know, which, is, which is the one that's more appealing? We always know that we always prefer the, the red line. In other words, we can carry on doing what we want. And the we is quite important in that. Who is that we? The high emitters, typically. So if you play this out, the science is broadly saying that from 2020 we have something like 650 billion tonnes. And these models are sort of saying we've got something like 1,500 billion tonnes. Now, there are models that are more than that and models that are less than that, but that's about the sort of middle range. So if you're a policymaker, you don't want to... Yeah, there's a big difference between those two. They make a big difference from a policy perspective. So why is that the case? How can that be the case? And so this is, this is my second favourite uh, climate change film. Um, Do Dr. Strangelove, if any of you have ever seen it. It's a really interesting film about men and technology, um, or certain types of men and technology. Perhaps.